Okay, everybody, we're gonna we're gonna start up again because uh, we've got the room we've got the room uh, to the uh, bottom of the hour. So um, thank you, Stephen, for thank you, Stephen, for a uh, lovely uh, lecture, and you gave us a lot of uh, you covered a lot of ground and gave us an awful lot to consider, starting with uh, lichen and microbial bacteria all the way to uh, computing power uh, of deep blue and beyond. So thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, I was originally going to maybe give a brief history from the Meditations on First Philosophy by Descartes, which everybody knows as the cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am which is kind of where modern philosophy's ideas about thinking uh, were, were written down in a systematic way. And from that, the scientific method actually grew out of Descartes', uh, Descartes uh, theories of how, how to actually approach the subject. But since the lecture, I've decided to not go into that uh, because we've gone a completely different direction. And I was thinking of the famous um, paper that was written by the New York University professor Thomas Nagel, What It Is Like to Be a Bat, yeah. uh, that was written in the late 70s, where he says that we can never really know what it is like to be another thing, because we can never be that thing and think that way. And you've given us a lot of uh, anecdotes about what it is to think and to consider what it means actually to be thinking. Um, is thinking part of consciousness? Is, is uh, thinking part of um, intentionality is thinking something that involves memory. Uh, there are a lot of topics that you covered in, in this paper. So what I'm going to do is uh, there were a couple questions that people came up and were, were uh, having conversations about. So let's open the floor initially to see what questions are out there um, that people might have. Don't be shy. Okay. Bruno. Uh, thank you, Steve. Can I ask you to repeat your concluding sentence? Um, if we were free will, and it was. Um, and you would cherish it. Yeah, if, uh, if free will is an illusion, it's one which I am happy to embrace and check. I think that's right. Yeah. And, and on that, there are two observations that I make. With regard to James, he's wonderfully seductive. That um, uh, you know, the, the, the idea um, that we hear two voices in our heads, and actually, I think it's such a great idea. But I just I'm never aware of having a thought that one I'm struggling with the decision that that second voice is someone else's. So I think it's really seductive and interesting. But we have to ask ourselves: is it is it correct? And I think psychologically, we might accept that. Um, it's very easy for us when we make a decision to do something that we think fundamentally wrong, we can ascribe that decision to another person, to another being, to a greater God. Is it not normally your wife? <laughs> so, uh, sorry, I'm just going to lose my train. So, so I think it's, it's really, so, so my point there is about thinking or accepting something that we know not to be true or choosing to believe something that we know not to be true. And on that, you know, I think you're absolutely right about um, wanting to believe that we are free agents. So I guess everyone in this room, you know, live and learn, learn, I guess, is not to live and learn our lives. We don't want to assign things to fate and love. We like to think that we're here because we're smart, we've done the right things, we made the right choices. There's a guy, I was just reading on my um, a book called Creating, Creating Freedom by Raoul Martinez. And he says things like, um, um, we do not choose our parents, nor whether they'll be happy or miserable, knowledgeable or ignorant, or sick or attentive or hopeful. The knowledge we possess, the beliefs we have, the taste we learn, the traditions we adopt, the opportunities we enjoy, the work we do, the very lives we lead, and our time and our biological inheritance, and the environment to which we are exposed. This is the lottery of birth. And the implications are far reaching. If we don't create ourselves, how can we be responsible for the way we are? And if we aren't responsible for the way we are, how can we be responsible for what we do? The answer is we cannot. Mm. And he builds this phenomenally uh, um, really, really um, compelling argument 
for the absence of free will. And I find myself, I don't want to believe it. Because I don't want to think that you know, the selective things I may have done have been done just because someone born to my parents in my situation would have done them. So that's, you know, so really I guess the, the two the, the two points I was trying to make straddle the one issue of how we we like to think in a certain way and we like to think that our choices are our choices because we like to be the solution of free will. And um, we like to assign that second voice when it leads us down paths we don't want to go to maybe another being or a way to go. When, when Sam Harris uh, says that uh, everything we do is already um, pre-ordered by the, um, the, the subconscious, uh, our subconscious activity. I think it fails to take into account that the subconscious must also be affected by the conscious. So when you, as a conscious being, have thoughts or make, make decisions, that must affect your subconscious, which in some way affects the next bit of what goes on from the subconscious, it seems. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can just say, oh, it's all down to the subconscious, therefore uh, I have absolutely no free will and no influence. Reminds me of that joke about the Calvinist who trips down the stairs and he says, thank God that's over. Because <laughs> <laughs> right? Calvinists don't think they have free will, right? It's <laughs> predetermined, right? So yeah, I mean, free will determinism is an old philosophical question that goes back to the beginning of you know the Greek philosophers yeah, of, uh, of where where we stand. Is it a spectrum? Is it binary? Um, I tend to think of things in philosophical questions as being on a spectrum rather than being absolute. So at, at the other end, it helps um, it helps take into account the fact that you might not be right the way that you think uh, to consider it on a spectrum. But yeah, this is a good this is a good point that uh, that you bring. Okay, close to Kant's categorical imperative. Are we? In what way? Well, that, that, that implies that there is there, there is uh, that every everybody has at the end of the day a similar view as to the rightness or wrongness of a particular course of action. That, that is something which is sort of floating around in the ether, which we all subscribe to. So that when we're presented with a choice, uh, a moral choice, um, all we have to do is ask ourselves, what does every, what would everybody else want me to do in this situation? And that is kind of categorical imperative. And you believe that that was a very important determinant. Yeah, so now we're getting into metaphysics, right? And, you know, is, yes. is there sort of universal forms, platonic forms that are exactly. out there that we that we dial into, and the ability to actually understand something means that we need to put it into a category. So this, yes, uh, certainly categorical narrative is, is kind of tricky, really, because where does it come from? I mean, you can understand the concept, but where does it develop from? Who's to say it's might? And if, yeah, so is there a universal norm out there? So yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you said something that reminded me of, they have a saying in the United States, what would Jesus do, right? Exactly. You're saying, what would Kant do, right? So, so there's the same, same question, yes. I don't know, this is, uh, I mean, a lot of people uh, turn their back on metaphysics. I think um, Stephen Coates, most of the, uh, obviously, um, you know, Southern Sam Harris is one of the most famous atheists in the world today, right? So he would completely dismiss this idea that there's a metaphysic behind anything. Um, I don't know, you want to say something more about that, Stephen? But, um, I think the, the, the atheist point of view um, is very hard to argue against. I mean, when you hear the likes of Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins um, speaking, it, it's very difficult to, on a rational basis, to come up with um, arguments that would defeat them. 
but that seems to me to leave out a whole uh, um, whole world of another way of thought. And I'm reminded of um, uh, Schleiermacher in the 19th century, uh, the philosopher who's said that reason um, takes you so far. But he, he was a, a, a minister of the faith, Protestant, German, German Protestant. Uh, he said reason takes you so far, but there is a point at which you make a leap of faith. And the leap of faith for him was in Christianity. And thereafter, there is another way that all makes sense. I don't think you can argue, as I said, against Dawkins and Harris on their, in their terms, but there's these other terms. Yes, sir. It's not. I don't think it's going to be possible to prove or disprove the existence of God from no. looking at the phenomena of the world around us. Um, but equally, one can't deny the possibility that there is a God. Um, so I don't take. I don't. I can't believe an atheist 100 percent. Why? Because it is always possible that we're going to find evidence of existence somewhere down, down the track. Yeah, so you're and saying there's a distinction between atheism and agnosticism, right? I don't really know yes, that there's no yes, God yes, without yes. asserting that there is no God. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, stating a doctrinal position of the, of the atheist is actually very philosophically defensible. No, I don't think it is either, but that's my own personal opinion. No, that's my own opinion. Surely, surely the atheist argues that they don't need to argue this. Right. I mean, that's the whole point. Because if you say the book is just a sick example, and the chocolate teapot, or somebody in the cult says chocolate teapot is brought together the 24,000 miles, and we worship it, you don't need to prove that it doesn't exist. And that's what they would say. And yeah, if a person who believes about the chocolate teapot needs to prove that it does exist, of course, one person believes that it's a cult. Many people believe that it's a religion. Yeah. But we're here getting close to Popper's theory of falsified evidence. Yeah. That it's possible that that, that chocolate box is a yeah. 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 It is possible. It is possible. So, but all we're dealing with is a hypothesis, which could be falsified. Right, right. But what would happen if you could prove the existence of Let's say the existence God, by definition, is that which you can't be Christ's faith. So, 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 therefore, you cannot prove the existence of God. You're saying you've got to hold out that possibility that his existence could be proved. Yes, I but the, the, the fact of proving the existence would be to deny this whole essence of, of faith. So, so it's, it's, it's a vicious circle, for instance. It's, it's a snake eating its own tail. I think the point that he's actually making is, is even more uh, solid than what you're, the way you're presenting it. You cannot not prove the existence. Existence of God is, is really what Popper is saying, right? Yes. If the statement cannot be proven to be false, then, then it cannot be argued with. So that, that's ultimately most metaphysical questions come down to this point. Um, we're talking about Schleiermacher, right? The name of Schleiermacher's famous book is On, Re On Religion Speeches to Its Cultured Despisers. That's the name <laughs> of the book. And, um, and uh, sums it up, really. Yeah, and, 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 and really, um, it is a book about people who who are making fun of religion, and as Coates is properly describing it, that there is this whole other way of talk, a language that you're talking about within a faith that does not apply to something that can be um, discussed in a scientific way. So it's it a very good point to make, brought up. Yes. What I think this um, session has brought out wonderfully is not just about human, not even just about animals, but the miraculous um, uh, cohesion, quote, quote, thinking of uh, other, other species. For example, fungi. Um, I've actually got the Merlin book, but I haven't read it. <laughs> um, and, uh, it, it. And another book that I have read um, is by Julia Anders called Gut, and she talks about the two kilograms of bacteria in our body, which we didn't invite in, they didn't ask to come in, they're there, they probably don't have intelligence, you know, quote, quote intelligence, but they have, if they weren't for them, 
we wouldn't be alive. And, it, you know, we, we sort of weigh about, I don't suppose they think about God too much, but, you know, it would be impossible for us to survive without them. Don't say COVID-19 is doing what it wants to do and use So, 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 Brian, so, Brian, where did they come from? Where did the, this bacteria come from in your gut? Is it from things you're eating or in the air? Or? Well, for humans, Sounds a bit naughty, but humans that are born naturally uh, uh, are brought up in the womb, which is sterile, and directly they leave the body. Uh, they pick up a whole pile of, you know, um, uh, bacteria, hmm. um, which is in a very uh, messy area of the body, so to say. Um, there is also the um, uh, debate about um, should uh, you know, uh, having uh, cesarean operations versus natural mm. birth. Um, I had to be a cesarean, by the way. <laughs> um, okay. Probably um, uh, uh, indicates my lack of huge intellect. <laughs> there's, there's so much that, uh, you know, I have hope actually. I'd never heard of the 11th century or the 12th century of course, collapse of that huge uh, kingdom uh, and I as we up. Um, but I do fear that we're on our way now to a similar the global mm -hmm. warming. Very few people are taking any notice of it whatsoever, um, especially governments. Um, and uh, so I think we can have a little bit of comfort, almost hope, that when the human race gets uh, obliterated by its own silly actions, there will be things like, <laughs> um, you know, the cricket crawlies and mushrooms and things left to at least have life on Earth. And by the way, nobody mentioned um, uh, octopuses with brains all over the place. Uh, anyway, so I mean, this is this, this discovering so much. And by the way, talking about um, uh, artificial, uh, artificial um, intelligence, sorry. Um, as you know, I, I joined up in the early 1960s, and um, uh, it was all machine language. I don't think, frankly, that however miraculous artificial intelligence, that artificial intelligence. Where is your brain today, Brian? Yeah. Stephen, you talked a little bit about this. Where is the intersection of thinking 